Uh, good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome to the Institute of International and European Affairs uh, for this uh, very timely presentation uh, from Luigi Scazzieri, who I will introduce uh, just now. But just to remind you that the uh, event this afternoon is on the record. The Q&A thereafter will be under the Chatham House rule. And uh, please also uh, extinguish your mobile phones, as they say, uh, put them on silent if you don't mind. And um, uh, we will. Uh, we will we'll just quickly introduce Luigi, if I may. So, uh, Luigi is a research fellow at the Centre for European Reform. He works on European foreign and security policy, focusing on policy towards the Middle East, Russia, and transatlantic relations. He has conducted research at the Centre for European Policy Studies, the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and the International Institute for Strategic Studies. He holds an MA from the University of Cambridge, an MSc from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and an MA from King's College London, and is the author of several publications for CER and Euractive, and a frequent media commentator on European affairs. So we are very interested on, in the outcome uh, of the Italian election, uh, what, it, what it means for Italy, what the potential scenarios might be in terms of government formation, and what the wider implications will be for Europe. And uh, with that, uh, Luigi, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here at the IIEA today. Uh, my remarks are structured in two uh, parts. Uh, first, I want to talk about what happened in the election and how we can understand that result. And secondly, analyse what the implications are for Italy's European policy and for its role <coughs> in the European Union. Not sure if these slides are just press. So here, um, just to illustrate what happened, uh, we have a map of the election results with the, uh, the results in each first-past-the-post constituency. In the election, there was a new electoral system where a third of the seats were distributed by a first-past-the-post and two-thirds by a proportional representation. The centre-left coalition in red got around 23% of the vote. The centre-right in blue, 37%. Uh, the centre-right being made up of... Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia, the Northern, uh, the, the League, and the um, and a couple of smaller parties, too. And finally, 32% for the Five Star Movement in yellow, the Five Star Movement being, above all, an anti-establishment movement. And I'd like to make several points about this result. First of all, the centre-left's result represents really a collapse. It performed poorly across Italy, including in its former electoral heartlands of Emilia-Romagna and Tuscany. And there are two key reasons for this poor performance. They are Italy's uh, economy and the migration crisis. So between 2008 and 2013, Italy's economy shrank by around 10%. It has since returned uh, to growth. Uh, we've seen growth of around 1.5% in 2017. But the economy remains smaller than its pre-crisis peak, in fact, around 6% smaller. Unemployment is still around 11%, and in the crucial 25 to 34 age bracket, it's 17%. In the south, there's a feeling of hopelessness, and in the north, there's a perception of decline. And the EU is widely blamed for this uh, economic uh, performance in recent years because of its emphasis on fiscal discipline, including the 3% the budget deficit limit. Likewise, the Democratic Party's management of the economy is also perceived as ineffective, even though it did uh, um, actually preside over some growth and it pushed at uh, the limits of what was possible in terms of easing the fiscal uh, stability, um, the fiscal limits at the Eurozone level. The second key issue, as I mentioned, was the migration crisis. Italy has seen over 600,000 arrivals uh, over the past four years. Now, this is a mixed flow comprising both people who are likely to be accepted as uh, asylum, uh, who, whose applications as asylum seekers are likely to be accepted, and people who uh, are not likely uh, to do so. Um, again, the EU's role in the migration crisis is seen as negative. France and Austria, on several occasions, uh, closed down uh, the border with Italy, and uh, the EU did try to help in some ways, for instance, by setting up hotspots in South Italy to help process migrants and by setting up a relocation scheme, which, uh, um, which was supposed to ease the burden from Italy and Greece. Now, it's important to note that, however, the relocation scheme only covered uh, nationalities that have a 75% or above acceptance rate as asylum, uh, asylum seekers at the, at the European level. 
meaning that uh, they are effectively limited to Syrians uh, and Iraqis. None of these nationalities are particularly represented in those arriving in Italy. As a result, less than 12,000 people are relocated out of the 600,000 that have arrived. And the government's handling of the migration crisis is also widely uh, seen by, by sections of the population as incompetent, <coughs> even though it was able to reduce uh, flows over the past year from about 180,000 in 2016 to 120,000 in 2017, thanks to a set of highly controversial deals with Libya, both with the uh, UN-recognized Libyan government in Tripoli and with a series of Libyan militias and tribes in Libya's south. The problem is that these achievements simply didn't filter through into the public debate. It was a matter of too little and too late. There were, of course, other factors in the poor performance of the, of the centre-left, one of them being the divisive nature of Renzi's leadership. He um, essentially uh, led to splits within the party, as a result of which a splinter party ran in the election, taking some votes from the centre-left coalition. And secondly, uh, the electoral system, which was new, as I mentioned, uh, facilitated uh, coalitions, and now this allowed the centre-right to stick together despite its, its wide internal differences. The second observation that I want to make is that the centre-right's performance was actually rather strong. It took over most of the north, including some of the left's traditional strongholds. Uh, there are several reasons for this. First of all, the league within the centre-right performed more strongly than Forza Italia. The League uh, was able to secure around 18% of the vote compared to less than 15% for Berlusconi's party. And of course, this reflects some changes that the League has undergone in recent years. It used to be called the Northern League and to advocate Northern succession from, uh, from Italy. But it's now dropped Northern from its symbol and become a nationalist party making immigration, economic nationalism and opposition to EU overreach as its key issues. And its slogan in the election was Italy first. Of course, this allowed it to win the support of many disaffected voters. But it's also simplistic to paint the League in quite the same vein as a party like the Front National. The League has been a party of government in Italy. It was in, uh, in Berlusconi's governments in the 90s and 2000s. And it also governed some of richest, Italy's richest regions, such as Lombardy and Veneto. So this means that it's able to pick up both disaffected voters and more mainstream ones, especially in the north, where it has essentially replaced Forza Italia as a conservative party. At the same time, however, the presence of Forza Italia in the coalition allowed the centre-right to win seats, in a, to, to win a share of votes in, in the south of the country. This isn't quite reflected in the map, which of course only represents the first-past-the-post constituencies, but actually it, it, they had above 20% of the vote throughout the south. Now, the centre-right was able to perform uh, so well because uh, it was... Um, able to capitalise on the two issues uh, that, that, uh, that are most key to Italians. Namely, it ran on a platform uh, of tax cuts, increased social spending, and the abolition of the controversial 2011 pension reform, and of toughness towards immigration. Finally, it also benefited from a broader disillusionment of Italians with the European Union. The number of Italians saying that membership of the EU is good for Italy and that it has benefited Italy, according to a survey done by the European Parliament, now stands at 39%, which is actually the lowest number in the whole EU, and that includes the UK. And only a third say that Italy's voice counts in the European Union. So essentially, I would argue there's a widespread feeling uh, that the way the EU is being run, uh, especially in, in relation to Eurozone governance and to the migration crisis, is not beneficial to Italy. The third remarkable element about this election was the very strong performance of the Five Star Movement. As you can see, it was able to take virtually every single first past the post constituency in the south of Italy and in the islands. Of course, this doesn't mean that its vote share in other areas of the country was negligible. It, indeed, it was around 30% in, in other areas too. Um, We've got a slide here with who, uh, who the Five Stars uh, voters are, uh, based on, on sampling done after the election. And I just want to say a couple of things, really. First of all, it is true that the Five Star is the largest party amongst the unemployed. But it's not quite correct to portray it as the party of the unemployed. So its vote share is not too different amongst professionals and, and the unemployed. And indeed, it's another remarkable element is that the Democratic Party is only the largest party amongst retired. And uh, likewise, a similar point here by education 
it's five star is not only the party of the of those with uh, with a lower level of education, but indeed it scores around thirty percent amongst the university educated, amongst those with the secondary education too. So it's it's the single largest Italian party in pretty much every every demographic. Um, the strong performance is in part due to the same factors that propelled the centre right. It's not in government. It was uh, sharply critical of the Democratic Party's record on migration. And it proposed a series of uh, tax cuts and uh, handouts and increase in unemployment benefits, which, of course, were, were vote winners. Perhaps most of all, however, the Five Star benefited from still being able to present itself as not one of the established parties, despite the fact that it has ruled uh, cities like Rome and Turin for a few years now with a rather patchy record, it's still able to present as a party that has a strong focus on anti-corruption and on transparency. It's important to note that the Five Star has moderated its anti-European stance. The, the party used to be rather anti-EU in, in past years and to call for Italy's exit from the Eurozone. During the campaign, this stance, um, it altered this stance. It now no longer calls for exit from the European Union. Party leader Luigi Di Maio defined the party as pro-European. He stated he would abide by the 3% budget deficit limit rule. Last year, as we know, the Five Star tried to join unsuccessfully the Liberal group in the European Parliament. They have expressed support for things such as transactional lists at the European level. And indeed, their voting record in the EP is mostly with the United European Left group. So in essence, this is a soft Eurosceptic party. Uh, perhaps one which is not Europhile, but one which uh, I, I don't think would be fair to simply put in the Eurosceptic box. It's not against the EU per se, but rather against its, uh, the way it is currently being run. <coughs> this brings us to uh, the current, uh, current situation in Parliament. There is no straightforward majority. Uh, in green, the League. In blue, the Forza Italia. In yellow, the Five Star. In red, the the centre-left. So, first, there's a couple of procedural steps before we get to the coalition building which characterises Italian politics, namely that the, the Parliament has to elect the President of the Chamber of Deputies and of the Senate. And this election will reveal whether there are cross-cutting convergences between different parties and will be a testing bed for coalition talks after. Following these steps, which will take place near the end of this month, uh, the President of the Republic, Mattarella, will start consultations with uh, parliamentary groups and will give a mandate to form a government to, um, to the leader of the League, Matteo Salvini probably, or to Luigi Di Maio, or potentially to another figure. In terms of what arrangements are possible, well, it's clear that the moderate coalition, as many hoped for before the vote of Forza Italia and the Democratic Party, simply doesn't have the numbers. It's possible that the right-wing coalition may be able to poach a few uh, MPs from other parties in the course of the coming months. Uh, it's also possible uh, that uh, the Five Star and the Northern League will form an alliance, as is uh, an alliance between the Five Star and the centre-left. And if all these options fail, um, the Italy's president could uh, try to form a government of national unity made up of non-politicians with support from across the political spectrum, which would uh, aim to uh, ferry the country to new elections, essentially. And I'd now like to focus on which of these op what each of these options would mean for Italy and for the European Union. So if we have a presidential uh, government of national unity or a centrist government after new elections, though the latter looks rather unlikely, Italy would more or less continue on its current path. Such a government would try to stimulate the economy, it would continue its gradual uh, reform efforts, possibly implement a series of tax cuts and increase in benefits for low earners, and ask the EU more flexibility, especially on spending relating to investment. Although, of course, it's unclear how much leeway it could obtain. It would be supportive of swiftly completing a banking union and more in general of Franco-German ideas to uh, reform the Eurozone. Although, again, it might not be trusted as uh, the combination of Forza Italia, uh, the combination in general could, could be perceived as unnatural. But I think in general the possibility of an ambitious Eurozone reform should not be overplayed at this stage. There's a lot of difference between the French and the German positions, and the, the Italian position is different yet. And yes, the other, uh, the other day we saw Mark Rutte come out with a series of, uh, of objections or what seemed like throwing cold water upon Franco-German plans, uh, essentially with a focus on budget discipline 
and the national dimension of reform. A, right, a centrist government would also ask the EU for more solidarity on migration and push for a reform of the, of the Dublin regulation in the sense that the country of arrival should no longer be considered the country <coughs> where applications have to be processed, which could also push for a reiteration and expansion of the relocation mechanism in the sense that it should cover a wider range of nationalities than it did. It could be more supportive of other items on the European agenda, such as more conditionality in the use of structural funds and further integration in European defence through permanent structured cooperation. And in foreign policy, it would continue to push for increasing EU engagement in the Mediterranean. And uh, although the presence of Forza Italia and, and other uh, slightly more pro-Russian parties could, of course, mean that Italy takes a softer stance towards Russia. So such a government, um, I think, if it's a presidential government, would be essentially a bystander in Europe because it wouldn't have the political mandate to participate fully in either in, in many new initiatives. On the other hand, a centrist coalition could be an important player, but as I said, this prospect seems remote. Which brings me to the uh, prospect of a right-wing government. Now, a right-wing government would probably be led by a figure from within the Northern League, although this wouldn't necessarily be Matteo Salvini, if there is a need for broader convergences with other parties, someone else from the League, perhaps a more moderate figure, could step up. Now, it's clear that such a government would adopt a more strident tone towards the European Union. It could be a spoiler, but I think it's more likely that it would be more of a drag. It wouldn't try to leave the EU or the Euro, of course, and its priorities would be boosting the economy and tackling migration. So in terms of boosting the economy, some of its promises included a flat tax, the abolition of the controversial pension reform, and an increase in social spending. Now, to do this, it, of course, could be tempted to flout the EU's 3% uh, rule. Now, we know what would happen in that case. Um, essentially, international debt markets would lose confidence in Italy's uh, ability to finance its debt. Interest rates would rise, and, uh, and the government would presumably have to step back from many of these plans. So, in essence, I would argue there's a sort of self-regulating mechanism at play, which doesn't necessarily kick in immediately. It's still possible to cause damage, but eventually it does prevent uh, too much fiscal or irresponsibly, uh, irresponsible fiscal loosening. A right-wing government would probably oppose uh, many of the proposed reforms to the Eurozone, um, partly because it would see them as interfering uh, in, in national economic governance, but also such a government would not be perceived as a partner by the European Union. It simply wouldn't be trusted uh, with the moderate elements, namely Forza Italia, simply not having enough weight. On migration, it would be more forceful in calling for EU solidarity and for a reform of Dublin, although I'm not sure with what effect. Uh, what it would do is take more unilateral <coughs> action. Uh, we would expect to see more deals with countries of origin and transit, um, and in general, an emphasis on uh, increasing uh, re uh, readmission uh, rates. In, in terms of foreign policy, I think such a government would could be... Uh, Quite disruptive. It would have, a, a, it would push uh, for a more uh, Russia-friendly foreign policy. So both uh, the League and uh, Forza Italia, especially the League, are very friendly uh, towards Russia. What this means in practice, I think, is that any uh, action to toughen sanctions or to impose new sanctions on Russia would be uh, would be off the table. It's far less likely that uh, it would uh, attempt to roll back existing sanctions. However simply because this would be so costly in terms of political capital and it would rather use its political capital in, in achieving, um, in securing further fiscal leeway. The right-wing government would also have implications for other issues on the European agenda. I think plans for conditionality in using structural funds would be off the table. Integration in defence would also be harder, again, because of the focus on national sovereignty, even though, again, I think it's important not to overemphasize how the plans currently on the table um, I think it's important not to overemphasize their transformational potential. These are small steps. And finally, there's a possibility of a government um, with, with participation of the Five Star Movement. Now, as I mentioned, an option is a government with the League and the Five Star. Um, I'm not too convinced that they can work together this time round, simply because it's unclear to me why the League would agree to play a subordinate role to the Five Star Movement when leadership of the centre-right as a whole seems within reach. Uh, their priorities, again, would be uh, securing more, uh, more fiscal leeway, boosting the economy and uh, reducing migration. 
Again, I think many of these promises would be unlikely to materialise, but still, it's clear that such a government would be perceived as most disruptive by its European partners and by international markets. Eurozone reform would be very difficult, both because of the completely incompatible views and because of the limited international credibility of such a government. In terms of foreign policy, we'd expect to see a similar impact to that of a right-wing government. Um, the League and the Five Star are both friendly towards Russia. Uh, that there would be a slight twist in the sense that the Five Star Movement has a very strong pacifist streak. So uh, I think a possibility uh, would be that Italy cuts back its contributions to some of the international uh, NATO peace, uh, or peacekeeping missions, such as its contribution to uh, improving security in Afghanistan. But it's interesting to note that actually the Five Star and the League have a rather different positions on a set of international issues. So for instance, the League on the Middle East peace process usually takes a pro-Israel stance, whereas the Five Star takes a pro-Palestine stance. And again, initiatives to boost European defence cooperation would be off the table. But I do think a likelier option than a government led by the Five Star and the League um, would be either a Five Star government on its own, perhaps in the near future, or a coalition between the Five Star and the Democratic Party. And of course, depending on whether the Democratic Party is included in a coalition with the Five Star, this could mean that such a government could play a more constructive role at the European level. Now, this could mean some progress on, on banking union, uh, more limited friction in foreign policy, perhaps some support for conditionality in the use of structural funds. So if the Democratic Party is included, there is a possibility that such a government would not be too different from a status quo government. Uh, but, of course, the key uh, issue is that so many of the Five Stars' position uh, on many key issues remain unknown. They have been in government, but only at the local level, and simply haven't had to flesh out positions on a range of international issues, and have limited themselves to saying fairly, uh, to putting forward fairly uncontroversial policy proposals, really. So, in essence, what I want to convey is that any Italian government that emerges uh, will have two priorities, securing, uh, really trying to boost growth, uh, meaning that uh, people would then feel um, more positive about their future, and uh, trying to better, uh, better control migration. A right-wing government would uh, have the potential to be a spoiler, although, as I said, it would be more likely to be a drag. One with the Five Star Movement would have the potential, especially if the Democratic Party is included, to be more constructive. And of course, a coalition between the Five Star and the League would be rather disruptive. But I'd like to emphasize here that Italy is a parliamentary democracy where actually the government of the day has uh, relatively limited power. Of course, this makes transformational reform and, uh, for instance, economic structural reform much harder. But it also means that in times of difficulty, any, any policy shifts tend to be constrained. And they will also be constrained by Italy's embeddedness in the European Union and in NATO. So on the whole, I would say the likeliest scenario would be that Italy will be an impediment, will add to the series of difficulties in many of the uh, issues uh, on the European agenda, but it, won't be, it will not be a spoiler, at least actively. The real challenges, I think, lie in the medium term. Italy's economy remains fragile, and even according to the government's uh, rather optimistic predictions, public debt in 2020 will remain above 130%, with unemployment still around 10%. Population is ageing, and Italy is becoming a much less enthusiastic member of the European Union. Any government may be able to provide the economy with some oxygen, but it will be unable, it won't have the political capital to implement the serious structural reform that, that Italy needs. So, two factors, really, are going to shape Italian politics in the coming years. The first is the stance of the Five Star Movement. There's a key question over whether the Five Star Movement will further moderate itself and become a somewhat um, critical and soft or sceptic party of government, or whether it will veer back towards some of its former positions and become much more virulently eurosceptic. And a key test in this regard will be where they stand in the European elections of 2019, in which, as part of which political family will they stand. And the second key variable in determining the course of Italian politics is uh, EU policy. Uh, I'm quite sceptical about the prospect of a, of a major Euro Eurozone reform at this stage, but there is a possibility that, of course, the EU will allow a degree of fiscal loosening, even though reform of the Eurozone is minimal, which would allow uh, people to again feel as if Italy's economy is truly recovering. 
And the second key variable is whether the EU does more to help Italy on migration. Now, if it does neither of these things, then I think Italians are going to become more and more disillusioned with the European Union in coming years. And if there's another major economic shock at any stage in, in the future years, then Italian politics will um, veer almost inevitably, I think, towards Euroscepticism. And at that stage, I think something that currently seems so remote, such as Italy leaving the Eurozone or even the EU, could start to become more of a possibility. Thank you. Excellent.